Welcome to Channel C News. In tonight's leading story, a group of students have encountered functions, both recursive and iterative. On meeting a group of monks outside the Towers of Hanoi, they successfully solved the problem using a recursive method and analyzed its runtime. In our other story tonight, the students also began preparing for their midterm. We hope that our students will be well prepared and wish them the best of luck. From all of us at Channel C News, good night and good luck. So as with every start of the week when I'm here, I like to present a historical figure, and this is a historical figure with whom I actually have a personal connection. This is Douglas Engelbart, who lived from 1925 to 2013, and he was the founder of human-computer interaction, which is the field of understanding how ordinary people interact with computers and how different design elements impact their ability to do so in a successful way. He's also particularly famous for the invention of the computer mouse. The very first computer mouse was created by him uh, while he was an employee, I believe, at Xerox Park Research Labs. And there's a similar computer mouse today on display inside Melbourne Connect, if any of you wish to see it. He is also responsible for the mother of all demos, in which he displayed a series of inventions that he came up with that would later become foundational aspects of our everyday computing use, including computing with multiplexing and windows that eventually made its way into operating systems that we see today. Now, a fun story for those of you in the room as well. When I was approximately seven years old, I lived with my family in Silicon Valley for about 10 months. And um, I fell in love as a seven-year-old. And the, the, the person of my dreams was, in fact, the granddaughter of Douglas Engelbart. And so we had a very exciting marriage in those six months when I was nine, or when I was seven. Uh, but unfortunately, we've uh, since lost touch. And uh, the woman of my dreams has, has gone away. So what I'm going to show you now is a short segment from the mother of all demos, from this actual demonstration that Doug Engelbart put together to illustrate some of these amazing new technologies and ideas that he had for where things in the world of computers were going to go. If in your office, you as an intellectual worker were supplied with a computer display backed up by a computer that was alive for you all day and was instantly responsible, responsive, instantly responsive to every action you had, how much value could you derive from that? Well, this basically characterizes what we've been pursuing for many years in what we call the Augmented Human Intellect Research Center at Stanford Research Institute. We're going to try our best to show you rather than tell you about this program. Okay, there's Don Andrews' hand in Menlo Park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way and we never did change it. This characterizes the way I could sit here and look at a completely blank piece of paper. That's the way I start many projects. So with my system, that's a good start. I'll sit here and say, I'd like to load that in. So I'm putting in an entity called a statement, and that's full of other entities called words. And if I make some mistakes, I can back up a little bit. So I have a, a statement with some entities words, and I can do some operations on these. I can copy a word, I can say that word like copy after itself. Let's make more statements. I'll say copy that statement, and lo and behold, I have another one. Copy that one, another one. I can even copy groups of statements. I can say after that one, copy the group from there to there. And it does. So let me jump back to the head of the list, and I can do things like begin to reorganize it a little bit. Well, I say after bananas, it's more likely that I'll uh, take the carrots there. So let me organize it by saying, uh, just generally produce. All right, produce, I've got carrots. And I'll move under there also bananas. And in fact, I could move a whole group under there, say oranges and apples also. Well, I'm going to do something called jump on a link. And a link is something that'll go between files. So what it's going to do, it says I'm going to go to your file name, a CNRO. So here's what I drew with a picture drawing capability here. It's a slight map. If I start from work, 
and here's the route I seem to have to go to to pick up all the materials. And that's my plan for getting home tonight. But if I want to, I can say, the library, what am I supposed to pick up there? I can just point to that, and oh, I see, overdue books and all. Well, there was a statement there with that name on it. Over, so on his display, he sees my text, so I'll execute it, and sure enough, it does. But what's that? Running around. Well, if he's looking at my text, he'd like to have something to say about it. So we put on a marker, a tracking spot that he controls. So he's sitting there in Menlo Park looking at this text, and he can point to it. But we've carefully reserved for me the right to control and operate on this, so my bug is more powerful than yours. <laughs> but we can have an argument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what they call a bug fight. So. We've set up now audio coupling, and we're both looking at the same display, and that'd be very handy to work. We can talk to each other and point, and maybe later I can hand you the chalk on this blackboard, like saying, here, you control it. But let's stay this mode now, and add another feature that hardware-wise is available to the kind of display we have. I'd like to see you while I'm working on it. And we're going to go for a picture down in our laboratory in Menlo Park and pipe it up. Come in, Menlo Park. Hi, Bill. That's great, now we're connected audio, you can see my work, you can point at it, and I can see your face, and we can talk. So let's do some collaborating. And a forthcoming involvement is this ARPA computer network, the experimental network that's going to come into being in its first form in about a year, and end up sometime later with some 20 experimental computers in a network, which would be enough so that I could be running a system in Cambridge over the network and getting the same kind of response on a CRT. And it may be that people there, yeah, the next time we have a conference in Boston, I'll try this from there. And in that network, we're going to try to develop a special service to provide network information, relevant network information for people, for the kind of information that it takes to operate such a network. Who's got what services, what protocol do I use to get there, who's up today, how much, where's the user's guide, where can I find the paper that describes this system uh, that so-and-so offers. Uh, and that's going to be a, a very interesting challenge for us to utilize our, our tools for organizing and retrieving information. So I'm not going to show you the entire demo, but you can see that many of the features that now we think of as like Google Docs or Microsoft Word or even the way we navigate the computer were all originally envisioned by Doug Engelbart and his team at Stanford. So if any of you are interested perhaps in maybe not being a programmer one day, but in, be in becoming someone who helps design technologies for people to interact with the machines, the field of human computing interaction is a really exciting and interesting way to go, particularly if you're interested in helping diverse sets of users. So this might be people with disabilities or the elderly or other people with special needs who have difficulties interacting with computers as they are. HCI, this field is dedicated to kind of helping those fields as well as helping all of us interact with computers in our everyday. So now I have a terrible dad joke to bring us back into the material. So why wasn't the string bean afraid of the daddy long legs? And I'll take any answers from the audience. Been learning about strings. What do we know about strings in C? Exactly, because it had a null bite. The spider was uh, not going to be able to do any damage. So that is probably my one and only bad dad joke for the whole semester. Um, so where we left off when I was away, we were talking about strings. And we talked about all these different functions that we could do with strings that were built into the C standard library, as well as some ways to implement them. Now we're going to jump right into code because I know all of you have been busy trying to get your, get your heads around strings. And so let's start with one called getWord.c. Now let me open that up here quickly. Yes, 
getWord.c. So in this program, we our goal is to take standard input, which might have any sequence of characters. It may contain spaces, it may not contain spaces, it might contain full stops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what we want to do is we want to be able to take this stream of characters and actually extract a single word from it. So I'm going to go over this one fairly quickly because now all of you are already string experts from the hard work you've been doing. Um, and so hopefully this won't uh, puzzle you too much. OK, so our first thing that we want to do is we want to go character by character and extract each character that the person has typed in. And then what we want to do is we want to see, is this one of the characters that tells us that a word has ended? So what kind of characters am I probably looking for? What tells me if a word has ended? Was it? OK, Jack, you're going to have to let some other people. You're already good for today. Who else said space? New line, what's another one that might indicate a word's ended? Well, a null, definitely. Yeah, what was your name? Isaac. Some punctuation. OK, so we've got a whole lot of list of different characters that'll tell us if a word has actually ended. Um, and so what we're looking for, another way of checking for this, is a non-alphabetic character. Now, this could also be a number. But given that we're actually looking for normal English words, we can say, well, we're not, we're not going to count numbers for this uh, purpose either. We're just looking for standard words. So get a character and assign it to the variable C and check that it is an end of file. So end of file is what it looks like. In it's like our null byte for reading in from standard input. So it tells us that there's nothing more to read in. And then we want to make sure that it was actually an alphabetic character that was read in. If it's not an alphabetic character, then we're going to terminate because that means we've reached the end of the word. So we are making a few assumptions about the structure of it, but probably OK here. If, C, if the character was an end of file character, then we know we're at the end of file. OK, so we can return that. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we are going to, let me turn that off. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we are going to insert that character that we just got into an array. And the reason we're going to do that is because we actually want to store the entire word. We don't want to take one character at a time, throw it away, look at the next character, throw that away. We actually want to extract the word as a whole and store it for later use. So let's go back up to our declaration over here. And we can see that we're actually passing in an array which we're later going to fill with characters. And if you've been paying attention, you'll remember that an array of characters is really a pointer, and it's also really a in C if it's terminated by, by a null byte. An array of characters is a an array of characters is a string. So what we're really doing is we're building up our string letter by letter. And so we have a length variable, which tells us where in the array we're up to. And slowly, character by character, we put our um, we put our letters into our array. What else do we have to do at the end? Once we've read all the letters in, what do we have to do? Uh, Tristan, add a null byte. So that's what we've got down at the bottom there. We close off the string with our null byte. Great. Um, and this, again, is just doing the same thing. We're going through character by character, making sure that it's an alphabetic character and storing it into the string. Now, the reason we're doing this segment over here is we're just actually skipping over any non-alphabetic characters that are starting off in the input string. So if I type 345 space ABC, what it's going to do is it's going to skip that 345, skip that opening space, and just extract the ABC. So that's why we've actually repeated that loop in there. Not strictly necessary if you don't want to truncate white space, but that's just an example of a way that you could find the first word in the input, take it out, and save it into a um, save it into a, an array of characters, which, as we know, is a string. Now, the other thing you'll note here is we've put in a hard limit on how many characters we can re read in. Why might we have done this? Why might I have put in a limit? Now, who, who hasn't answered yet today? OK. What was your name? Oh, uh, Kalen. Kalen, OK, take that. Uh, it's just going to be in the recording. Kaylin, why might I have set a hard limit on the number of characters that I can fit in using this function? So we don't overflow an array. Yeah, so we don't overflow the array. And how do we know what, how much space the array has with the limit? And how do we know what to set the limit to? Set it ourselves. Yeah, we set it ourselves. So let me go back up into the code a little bit first. Let's see. 
uh, where I have my, oh, there's no main function here. This is just an auxiliary function. Okay, so when I create, when I call get word, I'm actually going to need to pass into get word the size of the array that I've created for this, which is going to be the maximum size of our string. Now, do you have a question about this? No question at all? What happens if I have a big word, like a really big word? Make a bigger limit, okay. Do you think there's a better way that we could approach that? Okay, well, you, you, know, you know where I'm going with this, but we haven't quite reached malloc yet. But essentially, this is the problem, is that right now we have a hard cap on the size of the words or the size of the memory we can read in. And this probably isn't ideal for us long term. We're going to want some way of dealing with this so that if we get more letters than we initially set out, we can actually add more space for ourselves. And this is highlighting what we'll get to in the next two weeks. After we've dealt with a little more bit on strings, we're going to talk about how to deal with what happens when we need more memory than what's already available to us. Now, the one other basic string program that I want to show you today before we get on to the harder stuff is this program arguments one. Now we've already mentioned a little bit about program arguments, but finally we have all the tools we need to really understand them properly. So remember, I've got these two arguments to the main function that have been somewhat mysterious up till now. I did previously mention that argc is going to be the number of arguments to the main function, and argv is going to be what those arguments actually are. And let's take a close look at the declaration here. Can anyone parse that declaration for me? What's that actually saying? Over there. So you could think of it as a two-dimensional array, but let's, let's start a little bit simpler. What is that? What was your name? Isaac. Okay, so what is this? What is a, I've taken away the star symbol. What is this now? An array, an array of what? And what's a character array normally? A string. Okay, and if I make a two-dimensional array of characters, what's that probably? Could be a sentence, but what, what does the declaration actually mean for us? If we say a one-dimensional array is, of characters is really just a string, so it, it's, an, it's an array of strings, so it's really just a set of strings. And in C, we don't have this nice notion of sets, so we're going to use an array to store all of those. So let's go ahead and compile that. Um, if my computer decides to respond today. There we go. And let's see how this works. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to print out the value of argc, and then I'm going to loop through the argv value, and using percentage %s, print out each one of the strings in the string array. So let's try prog args that I just compiled, and let's try it with nothing, no other input. So it tells me that argc is one, there is one argument to the program, and that argument is the program name itself. Okay, well, that's an interesting default. Let's try this. Okay, and now we can see how the program is processing each of the arguments that were put in on the command line. So this is essentially a nice way for us to interact, to create an interaction between the shell, which is going to take arguments to launch our program, and the program itself. And we can see that sequentially, each of the arguments that was separated by spaces became a different element in the argv array, and the size of argv was set to six which is the total number of arguments once we account for the fact that our array is zero indexed. So that's all we've got today for our introduction to strings, and now we can start moving on to something more interesting and a real-world problem. Within the DNA are sections called genes. These genes contain the instructions for making proteins. When a gene is switched on, an enzyme called RNA polymerase attaches to the start of the gene. It moves along the DNA, making a strand of messenger RNA out of free bases in the nucleus. The DNA code determines the order in which the free bases are added to the messenger RNA. This process is called transcription. Before the messenger RNA can be used as a template for the production of proteins, 
It needs to be processed. This involves removing and adding sections of RNA. The messenger RNA then moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Protein factories in the cytoplasm, called ribosomes, bind to the messenger RNA. Okay, that is enough inspiring biology for you for today, and no, you haven't walked into the wrong class, but we're going to use this process of transcription as inspiration for our task today. So I want to introduce you to a mutation that many humans have called HFE hemochromatosis. And essentially what this mutation does is it causes an excess of iron deposits in organs, which is ob obviously pretty bad. It can lead to xerosis um, and to a variety of different uh, syndromes, which ultimately can cause pretty serious injury to the human body. Now, it is possible if you know that someone has this mutation and you know that they're having their iron, these iron deposits accumulate, to intervene early if you detect it. And in fact, this impacts such a large number of people that it's been worthwhile to develop quite a sophisticated testing regime. But because this is a genetic mutation, we are going to need to look through this long sequence of G's, T's, A's, and C's in order to find where the mistranscription is, sorry, where the, where the mutation is in their DNA that's causing this issue. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to cut up the DNA using biological pattern recognition. So there are actual chemicals that you can use to attach to different parts of the DNA and cut it up. So we're going to do that cut up uh, process using something we call restriction endonucleasis RSA1. Uh, which, or RSA I, I'm not sure if that, I think that's an I, uh, which enables us to chunk the DNA into different pieces. Then we're going to use PCR, which probably all of you have at least heard of from the PCR test during the pandemic. That enables us to actually make the fragments uh, numerous enough that we can then collect them in a very efficient way. Read in the sequence into the computer so we actually try and chemically analyze what the sequence is. And then we look for the mutation. So after all of that biology, we end up with something that looks like this, looking for the C28Y mutation. So at the top, you see human DNA without the mutation, and down below, you can see that that pink G has turned into an A. Now, all of that biology actually inspires us for a bit of computer science. Because the DNA is quite long, and it's going to be very time consuming to look for this tiny change in that very large sequence, this gives us a problem. For a given sequence of characters, let's say we have n characters, and we have a pattern that we're looking for, in this case the mutation pattern, how do we find where in the DNA this pattern exists, if indeed it exists? So it would be very helpful for us to know where in the human DNA it appears, and if it does in fact appear in someone's individual genetic code. If it's not in their DNA, we want to return not found. So there are a lot of different ways that we could build up a solution to this overall problem and attempt to find this mutation in someone's DNA. So there are a couple of different intuitions, things that we know about the way that strings work that might help us at this point. So who can tell me something really obvious and really stupid about where the pattern might be uh, given a collection of letters that start at index zero and go all the way to N. And given that you're in my line of sight, Toby, can you pass that back? What was your name? Angela. Okay, tell me something really stupid and really obvious about the pattern. Sorry, could you repeat that? So we have a pattern that we're looking for, like some sequence of letters, and we have an initial string that ranges between indexes zero to N minus one. Tell me something about where the pattern's going to be found. Maybe around the middle of the... It could be, but it might not be. It could be at the start, we don't know. But what, what's something that you can tell me for sure that's true, if the pattern's in there? The pattern has to be less than the size of the string? Yeah, so it's going to be between what indices? Oh, zero and n minus one. Yeah, so a p pattern, a matching pattern must start at some place k, and k has to be between 0 and n minus 1, and then it's got to be within that actual string. Okay, so tell me something else. Let's say it starts at location k, and the, so it starts at location k in the string. What's something else you can tell me about maybe location k plus 1? So let's say the pattern is L letters long, right, and starts at location k. 
What can you tell me about location K plus one? That will also be in the pattern. It'll also be in the pattern. So index K plus one is equal to is equivalent to what location in the pattern? So if yes. pattern zero was at location K, then uh, one position one. So yeah, k plus 1 is going to give us location in the pattern 1. And then location k plus 2 in the string is going to give us pattern 2. two. OK, so, so we're getting along pretty easily. So we have another intuition here, which is a matching pattern of length m, m not l, should match the string at all the indices, k to j, where j equals k plus m. So up until the length of the overall pattern, each of those individual indices much, must match. So every letter in the pattern must match consecutive letters in the original string. OK, so so far I haven't really told us anything interesting, but building it up slowly by obvious things we know is often the way we work as computer scientists to give us our overall algorithm. OK, so here's, here's another question for you. Let's say there are two letters left in that we've looked through the entire string so far, and there are only two letters left, and our pattern is three letters long. It's not going to be there. It's not going to be in there. OK, intuition three. A matching pattern of length m can't be found if there are less than m letters left in the string for us to look at. And the last one, um, let's say that I am at some arbitrary location i, and I find that location i doesn't match uh, the pattern, let's say, call the pattern p, p0. So then what do I know? Then the next number, then the next number of characters after p is not going to match the pattern either. So we know yet that the next, that p plus 1 is not going to match i plus 1, and p plus 2 is not necessarily going to match i plus 2. Um, it might be the case, but we can't know that for sure. But we know definitely that that is not the start of the pattern. So we can stop as soon as we find the first non-matching character. OK, so we've got four intuitions now. And we've got one more intuition that I won't rely on Angela to give us. And this is essentially if the pattern is of length m and you've already checked m characters, you don't need to check any more characters because you've just found the pattern. So that gives you the point at which you terminate. So we have a series of four intuitions. And now all we need to do to get our algorithm is to combine them. So I'm actually going to turn to Angela to come up with our first string matching algorithm. So you've got four different intuitions. And I want you to describe to me just in plain English how you're going to search for the pattern in the string. And speak into the microphone so it's recorded. Um, I need a loop to look through the original string array and then kind of match. Like, I need two pointers. So I need a point one. The first pointer will point at the start of the string array and the second pointer will point at the start of the pattern that we're looking for. Yep. And then compare the two, and then if it doesn't match, then you move the nick, the pointer to the next one in the original. So that's pretty much there. Uh, it's a little hard to just describe, but you, you pretty much got it. So putting our intuitions together, we're going to test each of the possible places in the string where, it could, where the pattern could be for a match. And the way we do that is for each location. So let's say we're looking at location 0 in the original string. We're going to check if the 0th index of the string matches, K, matches p0, the first location in the pattern. And we keep doing this. Does k plus 1 match pattern 1? Does k plus 2 match pattern 2, et cetera, et cetera, until we find a mismatch. And as soon as we find a mismatch, what do we do? We break the loop. Yeah, we break, well, we, uh, we break the inner loop, so we don't need to keep looking through the rest of the locations in the pattern. And what do we do with our, location, with our search through the original string? You move to the next one? Yeah, move to the next possible starting place. So essentially what we're doing is we're testing each possible starting place one by one. And as soon as we figure out that that starting place is not a valid starting place for the overall pattern, then we move on to the next one. OK, so. What's the running time of your algorithm? Um. So let's break it down. How many possible starting places are there? M, like the length of the first. Remember, you had one intuition, though, that said oh. it couldn't be all the way to the end. Minus the length of the pattern. Yeah, so let's say n and m for the length of the pattern. So it's n minus m. N minus m, but m is small and n is big, so do we care about the m? 
No, okay, so it's probably just n. So n possible starting places, give or take a hand wave. And how many checks do we have to do in worst case at every one of those locations? Every check? Maybe every, every in? Every, in. why would it be n? So for every location in the n, yeah. how long's our pattern? In. So we only would have to look at most m letters, right? Or really m minus one in the worst case. Because if we've matched, if we've looked at all m, then we know we've actually found the correct one because we finish early. So we have n possible starting places and m minus one, which is really just kind of like m for each of those. So what's the overall running time? Nm. Nm. Okay, so let's see n possible indices for where the pattern is located, m locations to check in the pattern for each index, and that gives us our overall running time of big O of nm. And this is what it looks like in kind of something that looks like C pseudocode. So for each possible location S, while S is less than N minus M, less than or equal to, go through each location in the pattern. If you find a mismatch, break. If you've actually checked all the locations, return the location you found, and otherwise just increment and go and check the next possible starting location for the pattern. So this gives us O of NM time, um, and that's the worst case. Now, do you think that's a good runtime? Not really. Not really? Why? Because if m isn't that small, then it would be essentially like n squared time. So if m is as large as the original text, then that'd be pretty large. Are we likely to do a search where m is the same size as n? No. no probably not. So actually, overall, this is not that bad. But how long is a, how long is a piece of DNA? Yeah, that's probably a fair answer. How long's a piece of string? But DNA actually has many, many, many what we call base pairs of these different segments that each has a different letter. So even though O of N linear time would normally be good in many conditions, for string search, it's actually not going to be fast enough for many of the things that we practically care about. So from the perspective of, is this fast in the scheme of all possible algorithms for all possible things? Yeah, pretty good. For is this a good enough algorithm for what we actually care about, finding HFE hemochromatosis? Maybe not. Okay, let's take another quick look at this algorithm before moving on and trying to improve it. And can we have a round of applause for Angela? <laughs> Toby, do you want to get the microphone back? Did a good job on that one. So here we have an example pattern and an example string. Now this is a very boring pattern and a very boring string, but this will just help to illustrate it. So let's say our original string is a, and our the pattern that we're looking for of length m is this string that's a lot of a's and then the letter b. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare the first a in the string with the first a in the pattern. Now the second a in the string with the second a in the pattern, the third, the fourth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we're doing all these comparisons only to get to the very last letter in the pattern, and that's the B, and that's when we know that it's not a match. Okay, well, we'll look at the next possible starting location. Let's check the second A in the pattern with the first A, the, the second A in the string with the first A in the pattern, the third A, one second, the third A in the string with the second A in the pattern. And I'm gonna get tired of saying this pretty fast. And then we get all the way to the end of the pattern again, and we see that A doesn't match B, and we move on to the next starting location. And now we try the third A in the string, and the first A in the pattern, and the fourth A in the string, and the second A, I'm, okay. Um, and so essentially we're doing this whole frustrating process, uh, M minus N times total, each time M comparisons. So O of N M times seems to be wasting quite a lot of work that we could avoid if we follow Jack's suggestion. So our intuition is really that on average, most of the time it's going to be the, for most patterns and most strings, you're not going to match the first character. However, if you do match the first character and you match the second character and you match the third character, then you might be able to skip a whole bit depending. Um, however, let, let's take this seriously for the, to start with. Let's say that our alphabet is 26 letters and assume for the purposes of just our analysis today, that every word in English has a uniform distribution of letters. So the letter A and the letter Y are equally as likely to appear in a word. Now we know in the real world this isn't true, 
but well, we can we can hedge for a little bit. So if it's true that we have 26 letters and we assume that we're picking a random pattern and a random string, what's the chance that the first two letters are the same? One in 26, because you've picked whatever the first letter happens to be, you've got a one in 26 chance of your pattern randomly being the same one. So we could, we could say that maybe, on average, you won't even match the first character, and so the average case will be that you actually get to do, you don't have to go through the entire string every time, you can just skip as soon as you've matched the first letter. Now that doesn't feel really rigorous, and it doesn't feel like a good solution to our algorithmic problem, particularly because we know that English does not have a uniform distribution of letters, and so a lot of the assumptions that went into that fast analysis are not that good. So really what we want to know is, is worst case pure linear time possible, and can we do better than that? And our answer is yes, but we are going to need a new tool. And this bit I'm particularly excited about because it's not normally taught to first year computer science students at the University of Melbourne, but I've been so impressed with all of you so far that we're going to do it anyway, and you'll now know ahead of time for when you get to third year if any of you choose to continue all the way through the major to this is normally taught in models of computation. So that's the very like the capstone subject for theory of computer science. But don't worry, you're all smart, you'll, you'll be able to handle it. So this is what we call a finite state automata. And the basic idea here is that we're going to conceptualize these special sorts of machines, and we'll call these machines automata, and they're going to obey a set of rules. Now these are conceptual machines, now you could probably build one of these mechanically in real life, but they're just going to be an analytical tool for us to uh, perform some analyses that will later make figuring out how to do that skipping that Jack was talking about much easier. So every finite state automata has a starting place, they have a number of different states they could be in. So if you can imagine that you have a, a bunch of light switches on the wall, there are only certain different configurations that your light switches could be in. Like the first switch could be up, the first switch could be down. If you have two switches, the first one could be up, the second one could be up, uh, first one down, second one up, second one down, first one down, second one down, etc. There are only so many different states of your, that your machine could be in. So let's represent each of these states by a circle, and we're going to add a line to talk about from a given state to the next state that it could get to. So for example, if we're talking about our two light switches, if the two light switches are up, you can't go from two up to two down immediately. You can go from two up to one up, one down, because the next transition that you could make would be flipping one of the switches. You can't flip both switches at once. We'd call that an illegal transition assuming that that's the rules of the game we're playing by. And the end goal of our finite state automata is to get to this last special state that we're gonna call Q. And maybe that's the state, that's the light switch combination that un unlocks the secret door to the house. And there's only one of them that works, that's gonna be our accept state. Now we can diagram this in a little more sophisticated way for, let's, let's try a real example with an object that many of you will have seen before. So here is an ordinary house, uh, ordinary combination lock, and let's say the code for this is 42, 17, 31. And let's say we start in the lock state. That's the natural starting state for, for a lock in this, in this case. And what we want to do is we need to figure out what is the flow of transitions that would take you from locked, which is our start state, to unlocked, which is our desired accept state, or our end goal over here. So if you enter any given number other than the 42, you will go from locked to locked again. So that's, however, if you're in the locked state and you enter 42 as your first, uh, as your first combination, you'll go to state A. If you subsequently enter 17, you'll go to state B. And then if you finally enter 31, which is the last number in the code, then you'll finally get to that unlocked state. But it's not quite as simple as that. You'll notice that even if you're in state B, you've entered 42 and 17, which are the correct first two numbers, but now you enter an incorrect number. Let's say you enter anything that's not 31, right? You enter anything that's not 31, you immediately go back to that first lock state. The whole thing is reset. So this is an example of a very simple finite state automaton that actually matches something that we know in the real world. And you can find all kinds of processes that follow something similar. Who can think of something else that you see every, every single day? I promise you when you come to uni, assuming you walk out of the house, 
you see another finite state automaton somewhere. You can think of something that has this kind of transition between three different states. Maybe, but that's a little too simple, probably because it's not clear what the intermediate states are. There's locked and unlocked, but it's not clear what the transitions are. What was your name again? Rex. Traffic lights. Traffic lights are the prototypical example of a finite state automaton. You go from green, and you can't go from green to red immediately. What do you have to do in between? You have to go to yellow. So you could draw up a really simple finite state automaton, which matches the traffic lights. You can go from red to green, but not from green to red. You can go from green to yellow. You can't go from amber to yellow, but you can go from amber to red, etc. So I'd encourage you, if you want to play around with this idea, to just try drawing up that diagram. It'll probably take you less than a minute. But as well as like drawing it out in this pictorial form, we can also represent it as a table that looks something like this. So if our input is 42, and our current state is locked, so that's our first state over there, then we can move to the next state A. If someone has just entered 40, uh, something other than 42, and we're in the locked state, we stay in the locked state. So that's this self arrow over here that goes from locked back to locked for any entry other than 42. And you can do this for all the different states and come up with what we call a transition table. And this is just a table that lists every possible input that you could be given and how it impacts your new state based on your current state. And this turns out to be an incredibly powerful idea, which is it actually underlies a lot of theoretical computer science, which is an area that tells us what is the fundamental limits to computation? What are the kinds of problems that computers actually just can't solve? Um, and so this idea, if you expand upon enough, will eventually take you there. Hopefully all of you have enough experience with C that you can see um, the way that you would actually write some code to simulate this finite state automaton. And here I've done it for you, although again, try do this with the traffic lights example yourself, see if you can write some code which will simulate that finite state automaton. We have an array for our code at the end of the day. Um, and we are going to say while i is less than three and there's input, check that the input uh, is the code that we want to enter. If it is, move to the next state. And so we're going to use code to tell us uh, also what state we're in. And then if the input isn't the code, go back to the start. And so this is a very, very, very kind of pseudo codish, not quite in C simulation. But you, with the abilities you've already got with a little bit of tweaks to get input from the user and to print some output appropriately, could use this to simulate our lock here. Now, why are we doing all of this? Well, it turns out that Jack's pattern search algorithm, and in fact, a lot of our string pattern search algorithms, can be represented using finite state automaton. And it actually tells us something about the time that it would take to process a string based on the kind of finite state automaton that represents our pattern search algorithm. So some of you may have heard about regular expressions, or if you haven't now, you'll hear about later, but these two can also be represented using this same kind of technique and will allow us to actually bound the amount of time finitely that a given search could take, which will be very, very powerful. So oh, it's disconnected. There we go. So here is our linear pattern search, represented as a finite state automaton for this particular pattern. Now we're not representing the algorithm generically, we're just representing the algorithm as applied to this particular pattern. So we can see that no matter what, um, no matter what we do, if we hit a mismatch, which is going to be our red arrow, then we go all the way back to the start of the pattern. This doesn't allow for any skipping. However, if you have a match, let's say you match the first A, we go to state A1. If you've matched two A's, now you go to state A2. If you've matched three A's, you go to state A3, all the way up until the last one. If you've matched state A9, and the next thing you get as input is a B, then you're in your accept state. And if you're in the accept state in this case, what's happened? You found the pattern. So this is an example of how to represent our given pattern search for the pattern AAAAB. And you'll notice that it doesn't actually matter what the original large block of text is, this particular diagram still represents the process. So let's now say we have two pointers, one pointer on the string S and one pointer on the pattern C, and we can now say what will happen when we follow a given one of these arrows. So if our pointer C is the one that's advancing along the pattern and the 
pointer S is telling us at which location we think the pattern might start. We know if we hit a blue arrow, so that's a correct match, then we advance the pointer C up by one because we're looking at the next element of the pattern. If instead we find a mismatch, then we move the pointer C back all the way to the start of the pattern following the arrow, but we also increment S by one because we know that that location was not a location where the pattern could possibly appear, and so we should jump to the next possible location at which the pattern was and start again. But as Jack will tell you, this is an awful lot of red arrows going all the way very, very back to the start. So let's see this in action and see how quickly we get bored. So by now you should be pretty convinced that this is not the world's most fun algorithm. Okay, let's do the same thing just for a new pattern. E-L-E-M-E-L-L-L-E-L-E-S, -E -L 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 -E -L -E L-M-L-S or something like that. So you'll notice that regardless of the pattern we pick, our finite state automaton is gonna look pretty much the same. Okay, let's run the algorithm on this one. And now you can see that we have some mismatches, but we're still only shifting by one each time. So this is a little closer to our one in 26 sort of behavior. But what we really want is a O of N pattern search, something like what Jack was describing, which is the Knuth Morris Pratt algorithm, also known as KMP. Now, I will tell you ahead of time that this algorithm is a little more sophisticated than many of the other things that you will see in this class. And so what we actually are going to require you to do is understand how it works, but we're not going to require you to be able to actually code it up from scratch. That's probably a little too much. Just being able to talk about how the skipping works is probably going to be enough, and also to build up the table, which will tell us how much skipping we can do, and we'll talk more about that soon. So let's start with a pattern with no duplicate characters. And what I mean by duplicate characters is this thing, the letter A appears only once, the letter B appears only once, the letter C appears only once, and the same for the other letters. There are no duplicate letters, no letter appears more than once. So let's go back to what Angela was doing before, and she was telling us, you know, sometimes if you start with some really obvious and stupid things, you can sometimes use those to build up an algorithm in a pretty sophisticated way. So she came by, she stated the obvious four times over or five times over, and based off that was able to actually develop a full algorithm. So let's add some more information now. We now have for a pattern with no duplicate characters, for any location in the target string T, if the match starts at S, then T of S is pattern zero. So this was one of Angela's facts that she kind of told us before. But then we also have another fact that we know by virtue of the fact that there are no duplicate letters. So we know that we've, if we've already seen a letter before, we're not gonna see it again for the rest of the pattern. So let's see, we've see, seen the letter A at location C. That's just some index. We know that for the, all the rest of the locations in the pattern, we're not going to see the letter A again. But this gives us a, something quite powerful. Now, Jack, do you want to preempt the next slide for me? Do you know what I'm going to say? Yeah, if you see the letter A in the target string, you know, well, the letter A is not going to be anywhere else in the pattern. You're going to be able to skip a bunch forward up until aligning that original letter A in your pattern back with the letter A that you just saw again. So if you've already seen the letter A once and you go along in your target string and you see the letter A, you're like, wait, that means the only place in the pattern that I could match this up with would be if I shifted the pattern all the way along until that A aligns. So that's gonna be the intuition here that really allows us to do this skipping. So if we find a mismatch at location C plus one in the pattern, move our guests for the next starting position forward C characters in the target string. And this is just essentially saying, push the string along until you get that alignment. So no duplicates in, in the pattern implies that we can skip as many characters as we've already matched. So if we've already matched three characters, in order to push it along, we push it along three spaces to the next possible new starting location. So at location S in the target and C in the pattern, if there's a mismatch, skip C letters in the target. All doing okay so far? 
Any questions before we move on to the non-duplicates? Um, can you just go over that again? Just like sure. the skips three characters. Let's start with a simple example where the pattern is A, B, C. We'll compare A with A, B with B, and then when we get to C, it doesn't match D. Now we could just shift the pattern over by one and check A with B, but we know that because there are no duplicates in the pattern and B already matched successfully with B, that that can't possibly be another A there. There can't be something to match with our A. So now we check A with D, that's going to be an instant fail. Now we've only done one extra comparison when we compare A with D and it doesn't match. So at best we can move the pattern over one more to perform our final comparison A with A, B with B, C with C, and then we're done. We've found the pattern inside the target string. So now we're going to throw out this rule about there not being any duplicates in the pattern because we know that's not always true some patterns actually are going to have duplicates. So if the pattern begins to repeat itself, so let's say your pattern is A, B, and instead of going to C, it goes to A, B again. Then we have repetition in our pattern, so our skip isn't gonna work because if we've mismatched the, initial, the second A, B, it might actually be the first A, B that was meant to be the match for that location. And so we can't push all the way to the end, We've got to only push back up until the next possible starting place for that string. Now this sounds pretty abstract at the moment, so we're actually going to go through some examples, but that's our general, general intuition. Is that a question? Okay, so this is what it looks like. Now you've noticed something interesting here. We're not actually doing that much skipping. We're still only moving by one location each time. Now, can anyone explain this behavior? Yeah. All right. um, even though we know like uh, which, like in the bottom, like the pattern, even though we know that it uh, doesn't match a specific letter, based on like the duplicate thing, we don't know for certain like the initial string uh, that it doesn't match a certain point. So like when we look at just AB, that AB could be the next one over. Um, we don't know for certain it's not the next one over, so it's impossible to skip. And what was your name? Uh, Zelfen. Zelfen, oh, now I remember. Uh, so Zelfen's right. Essentially what's going on here is if we find that we, let me start, start playing again. There we go. Okay, so the question is, which is the starting location at which the correct pattern exists? So just because we've failed on that letter B for that very first A, it doesn't rule out the second A as having been the location at which the full pattern would start. You'll notice that the place where we've compared up to in the target string is still one letter short of where we actually needed to compare. So we can only skip one at a time. However, if the, there weren't repeats in our pattern, that would have allowed us to skip over more because we would have known, oh, because that second A didn't match, then we must have been able to push it over one more. So we'll see that in a little more detail in a second when we construct the finite state automaton that actually represents our different patterns. Thank you, Zelf, and let's uh, pass the microphone back again. So here we have another example for a string that has fewer repeats in it. And let's run it again and see what happens. So now you see when we match two letters, we could, sl we could slide it along two because there was no possible chance of that we had mistaken the starting position as just the next one. Because if there are two A's in the string and our pattern starts with AA, -A, then we know that either of those first two locations could really be the final pattern, the final location for where our overall pattern matches. However, if the first two letters of our string are different, and let's say it's AB and the target string started with ABC, uh, let, me, let me actually write that out. That'll be easier. Let's do it here. 
Okay, let's say our initial string is A, B, C, D, E, F, and our pattern is A, B, Z. Right? Uh, so we've matched initially A, B, and we've matched A, B in the uh, target string, and now we see a mismatch between Z and C. Now, because there are no duplicates in our pattern, we know that this A could not possibly match this second letter here, because we know that these first two letters of our pattern are different, right? So we should be able to skip at least that second position as well. And now we try that third position against the position in our string. And that's essentially what we're doing here, is we're trying to do this skipping process, assuming there are no duplicates in our pattern, and then adjusting for the fact that in the real world there are going to be some duplicates. So how do we actually do this skipping thing with the presence of duplicates? So this, this is where it gets a little tricky, but where our finite state automata are actually going to come in handy. So this is really the heart of the KMP algorithm. And so here I've already constructed for you the finite state automaton that's going to uh, solve this problem for us. <coughs> now, you don't need to be able to come up with this technique yourselves. As much as Jack was uh, ahead of the ball and coming up with the general idea, part of the goal of being an algorithm algorithmician long term is designing these things in the first place. That's part of the really hard part of computer science and what research is about. So this is not one of the techniques that you're expected to have mastered by the end of this class. This is more once someone has designed an algorithm and told you how it works, then you should be able to construct something like this. So what are the rules for KMP with our finite state automaton? So the first thing to do is to write out one state for each of the possible letters in the target pattern. So our pattern is LMLLS, that's really hard to say. Um, and you write out one state for each of them where the match at the very end is what happens if you've matched that very last S. And then what you do is you draw links back from every duplicate character to that duplicate character before, almost. Their slight exception to that is you want to make sure that you're actually matching not just the letter, but a prefix. So if I uh, don't have my clicker with me today, but let's look for repeated prefixes in the string. So our string starts with, our string here starts with EL. Does EL appear anywhere else? Where, where else does it appear? Andy? Oh, it appears. It appears. L2 and E4, L3. Okay, so we have at E3, we have that same very start of the string appearing there. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to draw a line, a reject state that goes from E3 all the way back to E1 because that's where that prefix appeared at the very beginning. Okay, let's keep going along. ELE, does ELE appear anywhere, Andy? Yeah, where does it go back to? So, E3, L2, E4, yep. E4, L3, E5. And so we are going to draw a line back from E4 all the way back to E2, because we see that's where the ELE -E ends. So if it was just the letter E, a single letter E goes back to E1, but ELE -E goes back to the very start, that ELE -E prefix at the beginning. So you can see EL if you, is E1, L1, and E3, L2. So we have a line going from L2 back to L1, because that's where that prefix appears. And now ELE matches this ELE over here. So we have a line going from E4 back to E2, which is where that prefix ended. And that's essentially how we're going to construct this entire diagram. So let's look at uh, what's another nice example. Um, ELE over here on E4, L3, E5 is going to go back to E2 over there. Why? Because we have ELE at the very start of our string, and then we have ELE, and the first time that that appears as a prefix is all the way back, so that draws the arrows. Now, this is a little hard to see, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add colors to some of these lines just to make it easier for you. So now you can see that essentially sometimes and we're going to use this to build up how many skips we can do. 
So now let's build up what we call the failure function or the transition table. And this we're going to here denote as cpos. Although in the exam you'll probably see it referred to as the transition table or the failure function. So to build this up, all we do is we check for a given node, let's say L2, and see what index it goes back to. So L2 has a backwards arrow going to node number two, and so the value we write underneath it is two. E4, on the other hand, goes to index three. It has a backwards link going to index three, and so we write three underneath it. The only exceptions to this are the start node, which we give a negative one to, and the very first one, which we give a zero to. And this is always the case, and that's just to make sure that when we do this calculation I've got at the bottom there, index minus c pos, that that always equals to one for the start and for the very first node. Why? Well, if you've only compared one item, there's not really a skip to do. At best, you can guess that the next starting position is the starting position that you should go to. And that's really it for building up the failure function. Just like we were seeing in our demo here before, Well, that E could also match the E we just saw. So now we skip. Okay, we've matched E and L. Right, and it aligns the string to the next possible starting place for the pattern each time. So what we're going to do is we're going to write up this transition table, the number of hops that it takes us to get back to the very beginning. And then we're going to just encode that in C. We're going to write some code which simulates this finite state automaton, just like we did for the lock example. And so again, you don't actually need to be able to write this code yourself. It's more being able to understand this process and being able to generate this pattern and count the number of jumps for yourself. So how do we actually determine the skips based on the number of jumps? Well, there's a pretty simple formula. We take the index of the string, and the number of jumps, and we calculate the difference between the two. So this is actually why we've got this funny thing with the first, with the start, where we set it to negative one, and where we sometimes don't worry about the jump from E1 back to the very start. This is just to make our calculation over here for the total skip to work. So let's say our index is zero. That means if we haven't, if we start off right away and there's a mismatch, can we skip anything? No, we can't skip anything because we haven't actually compared anything. The best we can do is just move and check the next starting point. The same thing happens if we've looked at the very first letter and the very first letter hasn't matched. We can't skip anything. The best we can do is move to the very next starting place. Like if I compared E, if, I, if the pattern was E and the string was A and that didn't match, well, I can't move too forward because I've only compared one letter from each. The best thing I can do is compare the next starting point. And that finally gives you a hopefully more intuitive explanation of why we have negative one and zero there in our CPOS thing, which we're going to call the failure function or the number of skips. And then when we actually determine the total number of skips that we can do, they're both going to translate to one. And so the structure of, making that, of setting that to negative one and zero right off the bat without actually worrying about the number of skips and setting negative, setting negative one doesn't necessarily make intuitive sense. The reason we're doing that is so that we get this result here at the bottom when we do this calculation. So negative one is a value that we've picked especially such that when we do this calculation of index minus C pos, that it still gives us a skip of just move one forward. Now if we do that for something like E5 at the end, we can see that the index was nine. There are three possible other starting places. And so that gives us a maximum skip of six. And so we can at most, move six along, even though we've compared nine characters, we can't jump nine along because we have to be able to check if our alignment was in fact that other starting location. So as I might have mentioned a second ago, the C pos array, this one over here, we're also going to call the failure function. Yes, Jack. Is the C pos array unique to the pattern? Yes, so this finite state automaton, remember this is based on me counting up all the different places where that prefix appeared previously and drawing a line between them. So for any given pattern, that's gonna look different. Like if I do it for, um, 
where's my other string? If I do it for AAB, we're not going to get very far because we're going to have all these links going all the way back, which means that as much as the diagram will look a bit different, it's going to result in a failure function or an array that tells us we can't actually do very much skipping because always we can only really skip one forward because uh, our string has so many duplicates. And so every starting position is really another possible matching point for the string. And so we'll end up, uh, I would encourage you to actually, actually do that as an exercise. Draw out the finite state automata, automaton for this pattern and see that the KMP algorithm is actually not going to give you a benefit at that point. KMP gives you a benefit when our string is as close as possible to a random sequence of letters, all of which are different, and there are no duplicates. And that's because at each point in time, we're going to be able to skip the full amount. OK, questions at this point? Yeah, Finn. So for a given pattern, that's a really great question. Finna asked, is the program we're going to write do this calculation each time, or is it going to figure, kind of figure them out once and then leave it at that? Was that more or less the question? Yes, yeah, so like if you wanted to change it to look for a different pattern, it will automatically change the steps accordingly. Yeah, so the code that we write should be able to handle that. But you're kind of pointing to something really interesting, something that we're actually going to want to do in a practical sense in many different places is search for the same pattern, but in lots of different strings. So let's say I'm doing an HFE hemochromatosis uh, search, but it's not just for me because that's expensive to do it just for one person. I want to do it for 100 people and run all those samples at once. And so I write the program that will spend time constructing the finite state automaton for the pattern, for the mutation pattern. And it'll make it really efficient when we then search for everyone's DNA. So we do the hard work of constructing this table once, and then it makes our search every time efficient. We'll see, we'll talk about the search in a minute. Because right now we've only figured out this failure function. We actually haven't written all the code for, for doing the matching in the larger strings. But then let's say we want to search for a different mutation. Well, we'd have to reconstruct this table. And so our code should be structured such that um, it doesn't just simulate this one, but it can generate this pattern of links for any given arbitrary um, for any given arbitrary pattern. Um, but we've seen the technique to do that. Essentially, the technique to do that is to look for a prefix that matches a suffix. So we're looking for something at the end of the string that matches something at the beginning. So for example, ELE over at the end matches ELE here at the beginning. But it wouldn't matter if this, like, if that random E and L over there match that L and E at the very end. What we're looking for is things that match the start of the string, because that's going to indicate the possible starting places for our pattern. So another way of talking about KMP, it's the longest prefix suffix algorithm. It's an algorithm that looks for the longest prefix that matches a suffix as well. And so a suffix is starting from the end of the string, and a prefix is starting from the beginning of the string. So we can see that, for example, the suffix ELE matches the prefix of our string ELE. Can we go ELEM? No, we can't, because the pattern ends at that point. Uh, and because uh, the pattern is, sorry, the pattern is ELES, and ELES does not match ELEM. So that's not a longer matching prefix. Instead, our longest matching prefix uh, that matches, our longest matching prefix that matches a suffix is uh, ELE over here that matches ELE over there. And so we draw a line that ties the two together. Yes, no, confusion face. Yeah. Um, so like the ELE at the, at the end, it's, there's still an S after it. Is it, could, could there be like a longer, a longer suffix, which is more towards the middle of the word that matches. So, but then it wouldn't be a prefix. No, as in like, say, say you've got like a prefix and then there's something like in the middle of the word that matched the prefix, would that work as well? Yeah, if there's something, if, so here's another example. The E and L over here are kind of in the middle of the word and they match the E and the L at the very beginning. 
And so there's a suffix over there. It's not a suffix of the entire pattern, but it's a suffix of a part of the pattern. And that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for a suffix of necessarily the entire thing. We're looking for a suffix taking the pattern up to a given point. And you can see that, see that with the way we've done the arrows here, is as soon as we see a suffix emerging that is like a prefix of the pattern, then we draw an arrow in to match them up. Okay, uh, Jack, you had a question. At what point are we calling things prefixes and suffixes? A prefix is the start, anything from the start of the entire pattern up to some index i. A suffix is, let's say we have chosen to look at the pattern from 0 to q. A suffix is anything from k to q, where k is some other location. Yeah. For the suffix, it's, it's more arbitrary. You can end the suffix at any point in the pattern, but the prefix always has to start right at the beginning. Any more questions? That's when that actually reduces the amount you can skip. So what you'll, if, if there are no duplicates, which is the ideal case in the pattern, then you can skip all the, all the amount. Yeah. It's, it's actually a little, I will admit, this is the thing that I spend the most time preparing for for lecture for, because it confuses even me sometimes without doing a few handwritten examples. So I think that is probably the best way to go about this, is to tr actually try doing a few examples by hand and seeing why you can skip and why you can't skip in certain amounts and drawing out these kinds of transition tables I think will help. So don't worry if, if today's been a little tricky and a, a little abstract. I think it is, it is the hardest thing to do in terms of abstraction. No more questions? Okay, let's take a break till 3.07. We are back, and I've decided not to torture you unnecessarily by writing the KMP code from scratch, especially given that you are not going to have to write it yourself. So we will look at, let me open the oven, a version that I prepared earlier. Okay, so the two key pieces of this are going to be the function that actually does the search. So we'll label this one KMP. And then we'll have a function that does what Finn was talking about and building this, this failure function. Um, so for a given pattern, we actually want to be able to construct this table which gives us how much we should skip from every different point of the string. So the way that our pattern, our failure function function is going to work is we are going to start at the second location in the pattern. And why are we going to do this? If you remember, the first two locations of our, of our finite state automata would set up a little bit specially to make that C position skip calculation work. And because we've kind of defined that manually, we're going to do that in our code as well. So this is just going to set the first two indices of the failure function to be negative one and zero which means we're actually going to start doing our processing of the pattern string at index two. So that's location zero, location one, which means the first location where we're going to need to put in a new entry is location two. Then what we're going to do is we're going to essentially do the same thing as our finite state automata was doing. Um, and so go through all the different indices in the pattern. So starting at location S, until location M. So there's going to be one entry in the failure function for each of the locations in the pattern. Um, remember, we're doing this pre-processing for the pattern and not for the target. So if our pattern is that small mutation, we're going to build up the failure function for that mutation and not for the strings of DNA that we're searching in. Then what we're going to do is we're going to want to look through uh, the prefixes and check if they match the suffixes. And this is essentially what we're doing here, is we're keeping a pointer to the pattern and a pointer to, uh, to where we're up to in the pattern, and a pointer as well to the very start of the pattern. Because we want to see, does the very start of the pattern match the suffix, the part of the pattern that we're currently looking at? And so we're going to start that at location two. We're going to look, start looking for suffixes, because we know if there's a suffix at location one or location zero, those are already handled by our two entries here. 
And so we're checking, firstly, does, does the very first character of the prefix match the first character of where we're up to looking for suffixes? If it does match, then we are going to increment to the next part of the prefix. So the very first part of the prefix match, let's look at the second character. We're going to set a value in the failure function. So this is essentially drawing um, an arrow backwards to say that yes, we did have a match there and then incrementing the pointer in the suffix as well. Otherwise, what we do is we're essentially doing this backwards jump in our graph. So remember we were doing these jumps to see where was the last possible place in the table where that we would need to jump to. And so we're going to represent that in our code as well by looking at the value in the table already for that prior jump. And otherwise we can do a full skip, so set it to zero and then increment by one. And that's, that's really all there is to it. So it looks nasty and complicated and hard to understand, but if you sort of remember the picture, it becomes a little bit easier. Let's look at the main searching function now. So this is going to firstly create a place for us to store all the results of the failure function because we need to fill that table up at some point. So we're just setting aside an array for it. We're going to do our preparation, getting the size of the target and the size of the pattern because we're going to need those all throughout. And then we're just going to have our location in the pattern at which we're currently searching. So is the first location the place where the pattern matches? Is the second location the place where the pattern matches? So that's going to be our S. And our I is just going to be where we're currently looking in the pattern. We build the failure function. I have a function here to also print the failure function just so we can see it. And then we do our search. So our search goes from S up until N minus M and Angela explained to us why we don't search until the very, very end because if the pattern is M letters long, well, we can't start looking for an M letter long pattern at the second last letter if M is like five. There's just not room in the string for it. And then we check the current, char the current character. So does the current character in the pattern match the current character in the target? If it does, keep going. Um, and if you've successfully matched them all return, and then this is the kind of like interesting bit. This is if you have a mismatch, how much do you skip? How much do you skip? Well, you skip based on that count on that formula which we saw before, which was where did I put it? Here's the formula. It's the index minus that value from the failure function table. So that's the skip. And let's look how much do we skip? We skip the index minus that value from the failure function. Then we set i to be the value of the failure function at index i. And then we reset again if failure i was negative one. This is just a manual thing that we've put in there to make it work again. Yeah, Jack. Why does it skip past angle? Is it, I, I thought the, in the, like, if you showed a guy, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, then it was like the index. Yeah, then it's index minus the same as Index minus, so that calculates the skip. Yeah, so why are we going to skip to it? So S in this case is not the skip value, S is the current position. So it's the same thing. Uh, because S plus skip is what you want at the end of the day. And I've just, if I were to rewrite it that way, it would be skip equals, and then S, which is the current pointer of location. Oh. So did I make a mistake already? No? Okay. And that is the whole KMP algorithm. That's it. The hardest algorithm I think that we learned this semester. You've now all at least seen once and hopefully uh, we'll be able to understand in full in not too long. So let's do our analysis of KMP, which is actually a little trickier than it has been for some of our past algorithms. So we'll need a one or two new tricks. So the first thing to do is to break it up into two steps. The first step is what Finn was talking about, which is for our given pattern, build the table. And once we've done that, then we can figure out how much it takes to actually do a search once we've built it up. Now remember the very powerful thing here is we do this pre-processing step, this building the table only once, no matter how many times we want to search. So if we're searching a thousand times, we're really not gonna care very much as long as the pre-processing step is relatively small. So if the pre-processing step is nothing too crazy, 
then we'll benefit by doing that additional work ahead of time, saving that bit of extra memory for our failure function table and then reusing it every time we want to do the search. So here's the analysis for it. There are a maximum of n minus m possible starting positions. Um, so that's all the different places that our variable s can go to. There are a maximum of n minus m possible starting positions where we could find our pattern. At each location, we're going to have to do at least one comparison because we have to check at least that very first letter in the target string for the place we're up to in the pattern. If we weren't doing a comparison, then we'd, we'd already be done. So we have to do at least one. Um, and then we're also going to do a comparison for each position that we've gone forward in our pattern. So aside from the first one, assuming that we now do like another three checks, we're going to have to include each one of those as a comparison. But this gives us like a big question of like how many of those do we have to do for each position in the string? How much, how much skip are we, skipping are we doing is really going to be the big question here. But we know that for every skip that we do backwards, there has to be, we have to have moved forwards that much. So we can really pair them together. If we're trying to count the forwards, we can just count how much we've gone backwards. If we want to count how much we've gone backwards, we can also count how much we've gone forwards. And we're going to use this in just a second. So how many backtracks did C do over the course of our whole algorithm? So for each backtrack of C, we must have moved forward that amount in the first place. So we can pair these two together. And this can happen a maximum of n minus m times because we know that each for each backtrack we do, um, that we're actually that's going to translate to a skip forward on the letter on our s. So we know that in either case, no matter what happens, we're going to be moving on at least one. And if we move on at least one in our main thing, that can happen a maximum of n minus m times. So let's add together all of these different movements. If we match the final location, we're going to have an extra m comparison. So that's going to be a completely matching thing. So we have 2n plus m. So we have the 2 for the com s comparisons as well as the, uh, the, we have the 2 that accounts for all the times that s will have moved forward as well as for all the times that c have moved forward. Because we know that every character is going to be examined, each position in the target string is going to really be examined at most once. OK, what about our pre-processing step? So that gives us our search step. What about the pre-processing pre step where we actually built up the table? So we have m possible indices that we need to fill up. And how much work do we do for each index? Um, we're only going to do an extra comparison if we mismatch and there's a place to go back other than the very, very beginning. So that's essentially saying there are two possible instances. Either our transition table is built up by going all drawing an arrow all the way back to the very start, or in some instances, there'll be a place where we go back in the middle. So that seems obvious. Um, but if we're going back somewhere in the middle, that means there at least have to have been at least one prior match, because we can't go back to somewhere in the middle if there hasn't been a match to that point already. So for each time we do this backtrack thing, we must have gone forward at least once as well. So we can do a maximum of two M comparisons. It's the same kind of thing, saying you must have gone forward if you're doing this special backtracking behavior. So this gives us a total runtime of 2N plus M plus 2M for the overall algorithm, which is big O of N. So we've achieved our goal. So what about improving on KMP? KMP works really well when we want to search for the same thing over and over and over and over in different blocks of text. But we have other use cases. So here's one. We want to build a search engine that scans over every book in the Bailu library. And we want to try and do that in, let's say, O of n time. So these are some facts I got from the Bailu library website. There are 78 kilometers of shelved material on 101 kilometers of shelving at a utilization rate of 77%. Okay, why do I care about that? Well, that's going to allow us to do some calculations about how much text, how many words there are in the BLU library. So there are about 10 to the 12 letters in the BLU library. You can uh, share that figure with your non-computer science friends sometime. I think that's a fun number. Um, and if you were to do that, if we were to do our calculation on a normal computer, remember my computer does about um, 10 to the 10 
operations per second. So that gives us about 10 seconds for each search, assuming that we have some optimizations in there. So this is going to take up an entire computer's processing power just to do one search in 10 seconds. Is this accurate? How long does it take you to search for a book on the Bailu catalog? Half a second, that's a, that's a pretty big number. I'd say probably a couple milliseconds is how long it's taking. So O of N is not actually fast enough for this use case. We're gonna need a better algorithm. So what is our number one technique for better algorithms when we're trying to process large amounts of data? What kind of thing can we generally do? Pre-processing, Toby's got it right. So we do a space-time trade-off. We sacrifice uh, some space on our computer's memory and some pre-processing to later allow us to do things efficiently based on information that we already know. So here I have another live example for today because it's been quite a long, tiring day. It was, was it, what was your name, Perrin? No? Over there in the corner, green shirt. Yeah. Sebastian. Okay, Sebastian, come to the front. That's okay. It's it's been a long afternoon. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll come over here. Sebastian can do this one sitting down. He's tired for today. Sitting down. Okay, here we have a yellow pages. Have you used one of these before? Uh, I think I have. Yeah. Okay, I want you to find for me Ace Locksmiths. Ace Locksmith. Yeah, and I'm gonna go get the microphone, and camera can stay on you. It starts with an A, but that might not be much help because this is a yellow pages, not a white pages. I see. So what are you what are you discovering in here? What? Oh, it's a bit weird. Um. Yeah, I could. Well, it's, it is sorted even. It's sorted, but what's it sorted by? It's sorted by. By sections, like, um, like. Categories, right? Yeah, by categories. Types of businesses. Yeah. So Ace Locksmith sounds like a. It, it locksmith. It's a locksmith, so we go to. L. Locksmiths. Locks and locksmiths, yeah. It is locksmiths, got it. Okay, we got it. So this was a little different from, uh, actually, let's have a round of applause for Sebastian. You can kick one leg up in the air to... Um, so this was a bit different from our like kind of binary search thing that we did with just any old name, because this time we had an index at the very start. So we actually... All, all of the businesses were sorted according to some other scheme, which made lookup pretty efficient. Now, of course, we could do binary search on the categories, and then using the categories, then we could go and find the particular locksmith we were looking for, but that was actually pretty fast. And so that gives us a technique that we can probably use in the computer as well, which is to index data, which is stored according to some kind of keyword. So in this case, we were storing it according to the category of business that was for, or some other kind of shortened listing that isn't the full set of names. So dividing things up in some kind of clever way and then doing it from that. So for the yellow pages, this was quickly find a category in the list of categories. And for a book index, we might actually aim to find a particular word in the set of all the words that were in the book. So if any of you have used a concordance, for example, it's a special kind of book typically used with the Bible that tells you a list of all the possible words that appear in the Bible or that appear in another book and give you the page number at which they appear. And so this is a very interesting kind of index that allows you to very quickly find the location of a pattern in the larger text. So in the case of a concordance, it tells you where to find that word pattern anywhere in the giant text of the Bible, which is really a pretty long text. So what we want is probably some kind of sorted index and then a fast way to find the pattern in the index. And I've already, I think, given it away. I said, what's a, what's a really fast way to find a pattern in the index? Binary search is gonna be really fast. So we've got a multi-stage process, create an index, sort the index, uh, and then search within the index using binary search, figure out where to go as a result, and then 
if you if even the index has multiple entries at that location, then you can do binary search again within that location. So this is actually going to take us all the way back to the very start of the course with find repeats. So here we have a suffix uh, array. And we're going to do our usual thing and sort our suffix array. And now what we actually have effectively is an index of all the different locations where a suffix appears in our overall string. So we know, for example, that the string ls appears at location 4 in the overall string. So what this is actually doing is it's allowing us to do pattern search on that larger piece of text by processing the larger text rather than processing the pattern. So remember in KMP we were processing the pattern, here we're processing the target. So <clears throat> I'm using the dollar symbol here just to refer to the end of string and we're going to use this to optimize some of our algorithms. Uh, having that extra character makes it useful for us. But now let's ask a question, is ls in our target string? So what do we do? Well, let's do binary search. We start at the middle. We check if it's in the top half or the bottom half. We know it's in the bottom half. Then we do binary search again. It's in the top half of, the, of that bottom piece. Let's do it again. And now we've found it. So we can very, very quickly answer in just four steps in this time the fact that ls is in our target string. And even better, we know the index at which it's at because we've stored that alongside of it in our suffix array. So you'll notice this time, I don't just have the pure suffix array. So there's my, my pure suffix array. But what I've actually done is I've stored along with it, I've stored a column of each location that it was from the original suffix array. So there's the original ordering. When I sorted it, I kept track of the places that everything had moved to relative to their original one. So for example, the dollar sign was originally at position 16. And now I've still stored that number 16 along with it just so that I know for later when I'm looking it up at what location I can go and find it. So how efficient is suffix array pattern searching? Well, we do our same kind of analysis that we did with KMP before. We want to figure out how long it takes to do the suffix array construction, and then how long, it how, many, how long it takes us to do the search, which we're going to do many times. Now notice that this is slightly different from what we were doing before. Before we were searching for like one mutation or one pattern in lots of different texts. Here we're going to search for lots of different patterns in the same text. So similar idea, but depending on the exact structure of our problem, we're actually going to use a different algorithm to get our efficiency gains. So here we're doing the suffix array construction only once, and the search for a different pattern many times. So binary search, we've already gone over a whole bunch of times. Hopefully you know for your mid-semester test. This is going to be m log n, because we are searching for a pattern of length m. Um, and binary search is log n in general. So if we were searching for just a number, it would just be log n, but because each time we need to do m lookups, uh, sorry, because each time we need to do m comparisons to figure out if it's in the top half or the bottom half, then that's going to be an m at the start. But m, in, in reality, that's, that's a worst case. In reality, it's probably going to be closer to just log n than m log n, because most of the time we'll know on the first or second character, or pretty quickly, that we're in the wrong place. Okay, so how long is this actually going to take us to do to create the suffix array? So the, the naive way of doing it, so we're going to have to add in the n, n string, so that's just going to take n. And then we're going to need to do the sort of the whole array. So that's n plus n log n, but for each sort, because we know our string, so let's say we're doing this, we're creating a suffix array for a string of length n, at most, every time we do a sort of two items, it's going to be an item that has n letters in it, because it could be at most a suffix of n letters. So a, a, a string of length n has n letters in it. So when we compare two different suffixes of it, they're going to be bounded by n. So here's another example. Let's say I have the word cat. Uh, cat has the suffixes c, c, a, and c, a, t. The largest of those is CAT, which is three letters long. So we could say that in worst case, we're going to be doing comparisons that are three letters every time. So that's why we're multiplying our sorting algorithms, which are n log n, by another factor of n. 
and that gives us n squared log n. Now this is n squared, which is pretty bad, and even multiplied by log n as well, so that's even larger. Probably not great. Likely not what we're looking for. So we could do something a little bit faster. Toby, was that a question, or just stretching? So we could do something a little bit faster. We could slightly improve our suffix sorting by only comparing the, um, by doing log n sorts. So by splitting, let's say we're only looking at half of the string at a time and being kind of clever like that, well, we could get it down to n log squared n. Um, and you, if you want to see the algorithm for that, you could look it up. But really, this doesn't feel satisfying in a deep way. We've got this weird n squared or the log squared factor. Can we do better than that? And in this class, the answer is always yes. So one way to do this might be a better way of suffix sorting. So here we have all our suffixes. Can we sort them in a way more efficiently? So we could do a variation on quicksort. We'll call this ternary quicksort, but it's actually a subclass of what we're going to do here. It's a subclass of what we call a radix sort, where we're going to look at, let's say you have uh, a string of n letters. You could compare, you have, you say, let me start that one again. Let's say you have a bunch of strings, each of which have maximum n letters. You could look at the first letter of all the strings to compare them before moving on to sort them by their second letter, before moving on to sort them by their third letter, etc., etc. So you look at, you sort them all by first letters, and then once you've sorted them all by first letters, you move on to the second letter in each grouping. And that's called radix sort, but we don't need to go all the way. Let's just try it with three. Let's do ternary quick sort, divide them into three groups, and do it that way. So if we do ternary quick sort, that's going to give us some advantage. So let's say we take um, our seashells, sea, she sells seashells by the seashore, et cetera, et cetera. Let's divide it up into three partitions and then sort each of those three partitions recursively into three. So this is gonna give us some element of speed up and we can do this letter by letter. So now search all the second, do it for all the second letters in all of them, then by all the third letters, etc. So if we do this, we're going to get ourselves down to n log n. So not, not looking bad. Can we do better? Jack, Jack shrugs. The answer when, when I ask this question is almost always yes. But why does this technique work? We're avoiding repeated work here, just like we did with our KMP. Our goal is to avoid doing comparisons of the same thing over and over. And this is what this is going to allow us to do. We're not going to recompare prefixes that are common to multiple strings. So if we have a whole bunch of strings that start with the letter S, we only want to compare that first letter once. We don't want to compare that first letter for each of the strings in pairs over and over and over and over as we compare, do each comparison of, okay, should this one be first or should that one be first? Well, we already know they all start with a letter S in this group. So let's move on to comparing the second letter and that's where that savings comes from. So this works because the size of the English alphabet is limited to 26 letters, and so we can be guaranteed that we're gonna get these groupings of things pretty well. If we had as many possible different letters as we wanted, and our words were truly random, then we wouldn't be able to do this technique because we wouldn't be able to do this grouping that gives us this advantage of already knowing that, well, in this set, we've already compared the first character. So as we said, we, we can do better, and we'll call this one method X. Fancy construction algorithms. So we can get this all the way down to O of N, and this was a line of research for a very long time, including by people at the University of Melbourne. So you can see Professor Andrew Turpin, who was a very senior academic at the university here up until he left about a year ago. Um, and as late as 2016, there was still pretty active work on suffix array construction. Here's another example of people, someone that, whose name you might have heard of working on suffix arrays. Um, and we can see the name highlighted in there. Alistair Moffat, who of course is the author of our textbook. So what about more recently? Well, this is 2016, the optimal in-place suffix sorting. So we've gotten pretty good at it. Um, and we can see that we can actually trade off pretty significantly in the construction time based on how many words, how many different words we anticipate. 
So this is kind of a, just a for your fun information slide. You can see that all these different algorithms allow for different trade-offs. And depending on your exact scenario, there's going to be a different algorithm you use for either suffix array construction, or you might instead not even be wanting a suffix array. You might be searching the same pattern with lots of different targets. And then in that case, you'd use KMP. And again, this is the theme of the class that hopefully by now you're absorbing, is picking the right tool for the job and then seeing can you get any better, can you get any better advances for your particular context, trading off between the amount of time that it takes to write those algorithms, the complexity in storage, the complexity in time, and um, overall your scenario. So there are still improvements happening in suffix arrays as of last year. I looked up and there were stu still new papers coming out improving all of these methods. So this gives us our final analysis for suffix arrays. We have construction in O of n, and then our search many times in n log n. So use an algorithm many times, trade the repeated work. We don't want lots of repeated work. Instead, do some upfront work, and then the repeated work will uh, be less and will uh, you'll actually get a benefit overall. So we have one more problem in the last one or two minutes for today, which is to efficiently find the context of a key phrase. So let's, um, I don't, that's not a video. Which is where in a website does a given set of words appear? And we've already talked about the tool with which to do this. Which of the tools that we've talked about today could be used to find text in a web page really efficiently? So we want to find the context of a word. So it's what words is a word surrounded by. So you know when you type a word into Google, it comes out with a whole sentence of things that appeared in the page next to that in the search result? So I'll give you a hint. Index? Yes. Tell me a little more, Toby. Yeah, so you could use a suffix array like this in what we call an inverted index where you have all the different suffixes and you search through the suffixes and then you can look through the location and use that location to figure out what's on either side of them. Now, one other option for this is to also just store the context with the words in your table. So when we're storing the word by, we could also store the word seashells and the sea along with the word by. When we store the word sea, we could store the words she sells and shells by along with it. And this would give us another way of lookup. And we can also store all the places where the keyword appears like we do in a concordance, which we talked about. So this is actually a picture from uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, which will tell you all the different places where something occurs. And so uh, that is more or less our results from string searching. We can actually search strings in linear time, which is pretty amazing, despite the fact that it seems initially that we'll have all these other factors, as long as we have structure to leverage. So as long as we know something about the number of possible letters or the number of possible words, or if we're going to be, which thing we're going to be repeating, we can actually do our job much more efficiently. And the great news is in the real world, there is lots of structure. So our overall picture the big takeaway from today is that we want to leverage the structure that exists in the world so that we can create the right data structures and the right algorithms to solve our problems. Thank you very much, everyone, and good luck for tomorrow's test.